my, my name is Alex, as I said, Alex Rappaport. I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Flocabulary. And uh, I want to briefly tell the story of, of how this company came to be before talking uh, more generally about education in the 21st century. I was a music producer. I had studied music in college and uh, was making all styles of music from classical to hip hop to jazz, working on films, um, producing artists, mostly in the, the Bay Area and San Francisco. And I was looking for a way to make more impact with my music, to, to find something more meaningful to do with my music. And one day I met a rapper who said, wouldn't it be great if someone made rap songs that taught vocabulary words. And I thought that that was either the best idea I've ever heard or the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> I didn't know which. But I remember we ran back to, to my apartment and this was 2004, it was a long time ago. We Googled educational rap and nothing, we found nothing in Google, right? And imagine today if you went home and you Googled something, an idea that you had and nothing came back. How exciting that would be. So this was completely new opportunity that no one had ever done before. And this was long before Hamilton, right? This is long before uh, hip hop was what it was today. But we thought, you know, as growing up as kids, I grew up in the 80s in Philadelphia and in, in the US. And I had hundreds of rap songs in my head, but I couldn't remember the de definition of a vocabulary word on my uh, flashcards. And I thought, there has to be something here about how music works with the brain, where I can remember song lyrics all day long, but I can't remember my textbook or my flashcards. And so over the years, we built thousands of music videos, teaching everything from math to science to history. And we ended up collaborating with Bill Gates. We ended up performing at the UN. Uh, this company got a lot of attention because we were doing something totally new, which is of course the most exciting thing you can do as an entrepreneur. And recently, just last April, we sold the company to a, a wonderful education platform called Nearpod, which is why you see vocabulary by Nearpod. Now, Nearpod is based in Miami and also focused on how do we engage students in the 21st century. There's an Irish poet named Yeats, William Butler Yeats, who is attributed to have said this quote, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Now, let's think about what that means. A pail, of course, is a bucket, right? And as teachers, we're not trying to take information and put it into a bucket, put it into the, the brain of students. That's not real learning. That's short-term learning. The lighting of a fire means motivating students to want to learn, unlocking the passion that students have to want to be lifelong learners, not just learning for a test, but learning for life. And that's what Yates means by lighting a fire. Right. Another way of talking about that is the term student engagement. It's the reason that vocabulary exists and that Nearpod exists. And student engagement, in my view, is fundamental. No learning can take place if students are not engaged with what they're learning. Now, it's important to define this term because it's used a lot in education. And so we provided a definition here. Student engagement is the degree of attention, curiosity and optimism that students bring to learning. And now let's think about that. Attention is focus. Curiosity is wonder and interest. And optimism is passion and joy. We believe that all three of these components are important when people are learning, if they're going to authentically and deeply learn. Now, I, I was a good student. I enjoyed school, as I'm sure many of you did, but there are many moments when I was not attentive, curious, and optimistic about what I was learning. To the contrary, I was bored. And I'm certain that even if you won't admit it, many people here in this room found themselves bored at times in school, right? To me, that's unacceptable. I think that when students are in the classroom, we should do everything we can as teachers, as publishers, to bring the curriculum to life, to make school interesting and worthwhile for students of all backgrounds. And then in the US, all backgrounds means a lot. We have a diverse country and we have a country where students bring all sorts of different skills and needs to the classroom. And so to really create equity in education, we need to make sure that we're engaging students of all backgrounds. Now in the US, we have um, a school system. There are about 130,000 schools in the US. 
There are 50 million students and about 3 million teachers. It's a very large market, the education market in the U.S. And the market is, the, the schools are broken down into school districts. Usually each city has a school district or each county has a school district. So New York City has one and L.A. has one, Chicago has one. And each of these school districts is managed by a superintendent. And in a recent survey of superintendents, Gallup, the, the survey provider, asked superintendents, do you think that student engagement is important in your district? And 100% of superintendents said, yes, absolutely, it's important that students are engaged in my schools. But here's the problem. When you ask students the same question, are you engaged in your learning? Are you paying attention? Are you curious? Are you optimistic? There is a precipitous cliff that starts around fifth grade and levels out around 10th grade when students are, you know, maybe 14, 15 years old, one third of, now this is the United States, one third of students in the United States would say that they are engaged with their learning by the time they reach 10th grade. This is a big problem because low student engagement leads to students not coming to school. It's called absenteeism. And, and in the United States, it's chronic. If students don't come to school, they likely don't graduate. And if students don't graduate, they don't have economic opportunities. So engagement, for me, it all starts with what we're doing in the classroom. Can we get students excited about what's happening in the classroom? Now, Flocabulary's approach to getting students to be paying attention, to be curious, and to be optimistic is to make hip-hop music to teach. And that sounds crazy. So rather than just talking about it, I'm going to play you a short clip of a video now. Hold on just one second. This video is, as I said, we have thousands of these videos. This one is about linear equations, right? It's a math video. In the traditional education system, this is how I would teach you y equals mx plus b. I would stand up here and say, y equals mx plus b. Do your reading. Bye-bye. And then the class would be over, right? That's not enough for some students. So this video will talk about y equals mx plus b. And you can go ahead and play the video. I'm not lying, I'm a line. You don't need to ask me. I never curve when these nerves try to graph me. Pick a point anywhere where I lie. You'll find a value for x and find a value for y. Then slide. Go for a ride. A new value for x and new value for y. Check how my y gets negative and my x gets negative. I'm the best who ever lived. On the grab, there's two lines I'm crossing. I only cross each once. No, not often. They ask, what's your y-intercept? That's why I cross the y-axis, take it from a vet. They ask, what's your x-intercept? That's why I cross the x-axis. Better get a step and line up. You know we make it pop. Lines off forever, cause we never ever stop. Come on. With y equals mx plus b, b is the y-intercept, you'll see. M is the slope, rise over run. The wait until we stop, what that day will never come up. When y equals mx plus b, b is the y-intercept, you'll see. M is the slope, rise over run. The wait until we stop, what that day will never come uh, up. I promise you this. If you go out of the room today singing y equals mx plus b, you'll never forget it, right? And uh, this is the amazing thing about music. So there's three types of engagement that were happening just now. First of all, you're all smiling a lot more than you were five minutes ago, which uh, is one power of music, right? We just totally changed the energy in here from playing one minute of music. Uh, three types of engagement. Cognitive, what's happening in your brain while I play that song? Two, behavioral, what's happening in your body? when I play that song. And three, most importantly, emotional. What is happening with your feelings as I play that song? So let's start, start with cognitive. Um, music has this amazing ability to, this is where it gets really boring and research heavy, but music enables the human brain to store and instantly recall information. I don't know um, all, any of the Korean TV jingles or TV songs or radio songs, but I'm sure advertisers here use music to sell the products, right? In the U.S., we do this constantly. And sometimes I work with teachers or students and I ask them, you know, sing the McDonald's song. And they all say, ba da ba 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 I'm loving it, right? It's like, what? You know that instantly? Music sticks in your brain, right? 
And uh, what, what is so amazing is that we have this sponge in our head that evolved over tens of thousands of years to be able to capture rhythm and rhyme. And we rarely use it except for ba da ba ba ba. That's the only thing we're using this powerful tool for is advertising jingles. We teach children through music, right? Until they're about five years old. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And then they get to kindergarten and we say, no more music, tests, worksheets, that's it. Yet this powerful tool has evolved to, to, to store and recall information. Human beings used to communicate through music, through rhythm, through rhyme for tens of thousands of years before we ever wrote anything down in the ancient civilizations. Even more recently, do you know a book called The Odyssey by the Greek poet Homer? It's a big book. It's this thick. Homer didn't write it down. Homer was blind. Homer spoke the Odyssey and it was passed down orally for 300 years before it was ever written down on paper. And one of the reasons that this was possible is that it had a meter in the ancient Greek. The human brain is powerful when it comes to music. Another point, point number two, the use of music can actually help students who have learning disabilities or special learning needs, right? There are people who come to the classroom with all different learning modalities. Music is one of the uh, intelligences in the multiple intelligence theory. And so we use this program to help reach students who might not be reading as fluently as other students. And lastly, and, and most importantly, music forms long lasting relationships to academic content and to all content. I was in Hongdae last night. Did I say that right? The neighborhood, Hongdae, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've heard it called the Brooklyn of Seoul, so I had to go see if it was like Brooklyn. It is, it is in certain ways. And uh, I was watching a lot of teenagers listening to K-pop performers um, in little circles over in Hongdae, and I was watching how they were like crying. The, the people watching were so emotional with the songs that they knew. And, I, and I, don't, I didn't know the songs, but I could tell that the people who knew the songs and were singing along were feeling this deep emotional connection. And they were moved in a way that only music can, can move us, right? Pop singers write songs that make people remember where they were when they heard that song for the first time. It, 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 it has, music has an instant connection to our hearts. Why would we not use that for learning? Why would we, when, when the human brain and, and the human heart is so conditioned to, to respond to music, why would we stop teaching children when they reach age five? That has never made sense to me. And my whole business was built around the idea that even teenagers can learn through music. So it's all about emotional engagement. And what we say is win their hearts and their minds will follow. The biggest trend in education in the United States right now it's called social emotional learning. And it means that it's not all about academics in the 21st century anymore. We're not, work, we're not teaching children to work low skill factory jobs. We're teaching children to have non-cognitive 21st century skills like communication, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity. These are called the four C's, right? Creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication. These skills are not taught by reading a book. These skills are taught by interacting with each other. And so social emotional learning or SEL is what a great deal of US education policy is focused on. And it all comes down for us when their hearts and their minds will follow. So I've been talking about music, but I haven't yet talked about hip hop. Uh, you know, what, what we just did with Y equals MX plus B could have been any genre of music. Y equals MX plus B could be opera, right? It could be country music. Y equals MX plus B, could, you know, anything you want it to be. Uh, it's still music. It's still rhythm and, and chant and rhyme. But why hip hop? So the reason is from a research standpoint that student engagement and academic achievement increase when students' interests are reflected in the classroom. Is there any more popular music in the, in the world than hip hop? The answer is no, there is not any more popular music. Hip hop, according to Spotify, they did an analysis of 20 billion songs. Hip hop is the most streamed genre of music on Spotify in the entire world. And I have personally experienced this traveling to Kenya 
and traveling to South America and traveling to Germany and traveling here and watching K-pop last night, there is no doubt in my mind that hip-hop is the source of this global expansion of youth culture, right? And as, we, as you start to understand the origins of the music and the, the, the clothing style and the dancing, you realize that hip-hop has become synonymous or the same as global youth culture around the world. And so when we think about why hip-hop, this is what students love. And I'm not, when I say students, I don't mean one kind of student. I mean students all over the world. Students love hip-hop. And so if we, if we reflect it and we respect it in the classroom, uh, student engagement soars. So I'm not sure if you all know the origins of hip-hop, but it comes from New York City. And if you had to put one date on when hip-hop started, it was August 1973. Now, it was just before school was starting, and the kids were having parties in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. This is uh, a part of New York City, kind of north of Manhattan. And in the early 70s in the South Bronx, there was a tremendous amount of poverty. Real, I mean, op oppressed poverty. There were communities that were torn apart by highways that were running through neighborhoods, right? People were building, there were, there were, there were neighborhoods with communities and then all of a sudden, we built highways running through and we divided people. And there were institutional policies that kept people in poverty in these communities. And so kids had to figure out, how do we have fun? And hip hop came out of this poverty and oppression in the South Bronx, not in spite of it, but also because of it, because the kids had to be creative. Do you know that graffiti started on subway trains because students didn't have anywhere, kids didn't have anywhere else to paint. So they said, where can I, where can I spray paint where the most people will see it? And so they put it, put it on the trains and the trains traveled all over New York City and millions of people saw it because no one would give these kids a chance to show any artwork in a gallery because they were from the Bronx or because of the color of their skin or whatever it was. So the, there's a DJ from Jamaica who used to love records, like especially James Brown. And his mom had one rule in the house. His mom said, never touch the record. Never touch the record, because you'll, you'll scratch it. That was the one rule of, of vinyl, right, of records. You never touch it. So these kids said, you know what? We're going to touch it, <laughs> because kids love to do what their parents tell them not to do. So they started touching the record, and they started it, 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 it was scratching the record, right? And then they, they figured out, there's this one part in the James Brown song, every time when they're at the dance, there's one part of the James Brown song where everyone really starts dancing. That was the drum break. Just that part. And everyone's really freaking out. So they said, what if I could pick up the needle and just keep looping or sampling that, that drum section? And that's what they did at this party in 1973. The origin of hip hop comes from kids trying to figure out how to have fun and breaking their mother's rules by touching the record. They loop that, that James Brown drum sample, and nothing has ever been the same. What I saw in Hongdae last night is the same exact spirit that was there in 1973 in the South Bronx. And hip-hop for them, for these kids in 1973, gave them a voice when they didn't have it. And here's what, I, here's what, what came to me last night. They were disenfranchised in the Bronx Every teenager in their own small way feels disenfranchised. You remember how it was to be a teenager? You always felt like your parents are telling you what to do and society is telling you what to do. Hip-hop gives us a voice. So we go from the Bronx to BTS and we see all around the world that kids love hip-hop. Why? Yes, because it's music and it stimulates our brain and our hearts but even more so because it gives us a voice. Imagine if I can dress that way and dye my hair that way and dance that way to express myself, to have fun, and it gives a voice to kids from all over the world. It's just that powerful. Something that started in poverty against all odds, right? The rose that grew from concrete, a rose that grew out of the dilapidated concrete of the South Bronx. Tupac said this, the rose that grew from concrete can now Something that was started by kids in the South Bronx can become a global phenomenon. And this group is the most popular group since the Beatles and the Monkees 
and it came out of soul and it's hip hop and it's beautiful. And so we take all of this, we take the power of music, we take the power of youth culture and we bring it into the classroom to try to inspire kids. So teaching through hip hop taps into this ancient power we have to remember music and lyrics and it harnesses the power of youth culture to connect with the kids of today. And that is the, this powerful combination that vocabulary has brought to students in the US and increasingly around the world. Uh, and I would like to close by saying, I, 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 you know, as we think about education, we're not all going to be rapping or making music videos. I understand that's a bit unusual. But what we do need to do to meet the needs of, of diverse 21st century learners is connect with them emotionally and we must always remember to bring our creativity to education to make it innovative, engaging, and culturally relevant for all. Thank you very much. The World Knowledge Forum.